First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and all of you for coming. I also want to thank the UPUM collaboration, both the Science Foundation that made it possible, but also the members of the collaboration that I've learned a lot from them and I bothered them with lots of questions and I got patient explanations. I'm an outsider to this field, so I would really appreciate it. And this is nice for a collaboration meeting. If you point out errors, omissions, mistakes and so forth, and even more so references that I'm not aware of. And so I would definitely benefit from it. So I'll be talking about work that I've been doing over more than a year now with a fantastic group of students and postdocs at IAS, primarily with Shu Heng Shao. And I believe he's here. And if there are any details I'm not clear on, we should ask him because he understands that better than I do. The topic is standard and exotic systems from the lattice to the continuum and back. I'll start by explaining what I mean by the exotic systems and I'll define them. And throughout the talk, you will understand what I, why I'm having here this topic of why the title is from the lattice to the continuum and back. So over the last few years, I've been interested in various exotic lattice systems. And my main interest in them was that they, are, they challenge a standard continuum field theory description. There might be other reasons to be interested in them for condensed matter physics, maybe for building devices and so forth. But my focus was on the challenge to fit them into continuum quantum field theory. And these models include models of fractals, starting with the pioneering work of Shamon and Ha and a lot of follow-up work, but also other models that do not have fractals like the XY plaquette lattice model of Paramakanti, Valens, and Fisher. This model will figure quite prominently in this talk because it's the simplest models I, model I know of which exhibits some of the peculiarities I'd like to point out. The main point about these models is actually not the existence of fractals. Fractals might or might not be there. In fact, this model does not have fractals. But the main reason these models are challenging for continuum quantum field theory is that they're characterized by having an exact or emergent subsystem global symmetry. As far as I know, subsystem symmetries first appear in this paper by Lohler and Fratkin, but for all I know, there could have been earlier papers. And it is sometimes presented in the literature as being in between global symmetry and gauge symmetry. This is really misleading. These are special kinds of global symmetries. The Hilbert space is in the representation of this symmetry, unlike a gauge symmetry. The operators can transform under this symmetry, unlike a gauge symmetry, and so forth. So we'll see a lot of examples of that below. And when we try to think of them, some things immediately come to mind. First of all, throughout the talk, I'll talk mostly about U1 subsystem symmetries, but the extension to Zn is more or less straightforward. The advantage of U1 as opposed to discrete symmetry like Zn is that the global symmetry is associated with the net current. So we can discuss everything locally by identifying the net current of the symmetry. And the other aspect of these subsystem symmetry is what makes them so challenging for continuum field theory. When we say subsystem symmetry, we mean that the symmetry does not rotate all the spins in space simultaneously, but rotates all the spins in a subspace of space. For example, the xy plane at fixed value of z, or more complicated situations. That means that if we start from a lattice with lattice spacing A, with say L layers in the z direction, then the number of generators of the global symmetry grows with the number of sites in the lattice. There's a separate charge for each value of z, or if we are in two plus one dimension, there's a separate charge for each value of x and a separate charge for each value of y. So the number of charges grows, and if we try to take a continuum limit, the size of the global symmetry group in the continuum limit would be infinite. This has many interesting consequences. For one thing, we can have a state that has one charge, as charge one, say, at one value of x, and zero elsewhere. 
In another state with the non-zero charge, you get another value of x. That means that in the continuum limit, operators like the charge of the system can be discontinuous as a function of x. This is something that I'm not familiar with in other contexts in continuum field theory, that we have a physical observable whose long distance behavior is necessarily discontinuous. And this follows directly from the existence of this subsystem global symmetry. I would like to add here parenthetically that this is a mixture of UV and IR, a mixture of short distance physics with long distance phenomena. The long distance behavior of the system, like the correlation functions at very long distances, because of that, they are very sensitive to what happens at short distances. This is again, unlike what we are used to in standard systems. And I would add parenthetically that we have seen in the context of string theory, some other systems that mix the UV IR decoupling, the fact that scale, the separation in scales based on length scale is not as clear as in standard systems. I'm not going to discuss it here, but if there are later questions, I can talk some more about the relation between these different phenomena. So my own motivation in studying all that was to find a field theory description of these exotic systems. And it's guaranteed to be non-trivial, it's guaranteed to be non-standard because of this peculiarity that I mentioned here. And there are two reasons to be interested in such a description. First, we would like to classify the exotic systems. So we clearly classify systems by their global symmetry, but we should classify them only by the symmetries we see at long distances, not by symmetries at short distances. So we should include in the classification all the emergent symmetries, and we should not include in the classification system symmetries that do not act at long distances. Also, in the spirit of field theory, we would like to write some kind of a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian in continu or continuum fields, such that it captures the long distance behavior and gives it and focuses on the universal information, throwing out all the irrelevant information. In the opposite direction, these systems go outside the standard framework of quantum field theory. And, as, and that's true also for these string constructions that I will now be talking about. So all these are signs that our standard description of quantum field theory, continuum quantum field theory is incomplete. And as such, perhaps these systems can give us some insight into that. So let me start by discussing the simplest system of this kind, which is the two plus one dimensional model, which we can call the XY plaquette model. It's, an, it's a cousin of, it's a remote cousin, but the cousin of the ordinary XY model. And being a high energy physicist, I prefer to work with Euclidean time Lagrangian formulation. That's not essential. We can easily take that to Lorentzian time in a Hamiltonian formulation or with a Lagrangian formulation with continuous time. So the model of Farmer, Canty, Balance and Fisher has the following action. We sum over the time-like links with coefficient beta naught with the cosine of the derivative of the time difference along, along the time, the, the, the variation, the difference along the time link of phi. And then there's another term, which is around spatial plaquettes. In every spatial plaquette, this is an orient, a sum around the plaquette with alternating signs with the cosine. I think these authors studied the, the continuous time. This is a discrete time version of the same system. So it's essentially the same. This, this action lacks the standard term in the XY model of cosine delta X phi or cosine delta Y phi. But this is technically natural in using the high energy terminology because this system has a U1 subsystem global symmetry where we shift phi by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. You can check that these two terms are invariant under this global symmetry, no matter how complicated these functions are. And furthermore, this is a global symmetry because they are independent of time. These functions are, have to be independent of time. Here and throughout this talk, I use the high energy slash string theory terminology. With this symmetry, I'll refer to it as a momentum symmetry. This should not be confused with momentum in space time, which in this case is two plus one dimensional. If you wish, this is momentum in the target space. 
So this is the momentum that shifts phi, thinking of phi as a coordinate, it shift, this is the symmetry of shifting phi by a constant, or in this case, function of x plus function of y. So whatever the motivation for the terminology, I'll refer to this symmetry as being momentum. There's an obvious way of taking the continuum limit of this system, which also appeared in their paper, and this is to write this action. So in the coming slides, I'm just going to ignore the lattice system and just discuss this continuum Lagrangian or continuum action and see what the consequences are. And then we'll go back to the lattice. So let's start with this action. First of all, it's free. Unlike the, the lattice action, which had all these cosines, this action is free. So it's completely straightforward to analyze it. If you, the condensed matter language is Gaussian in high energy physics terminology, it's free. That does not change the fact that it's trivial or straight, maybe I should say straightforward to analyze it. I misspoke, it is straightforward, but it's non-trivial. It's non-trivial because the derivative structure here means that some discontinuous field configurations are not suppressed. Normally we have terms like partial x phi quantity square plus partial y phi quantity square. And if phi is a discontinuity, the derivative is infinite, the action is infinite, and hence this configuration is suppressed in the function of the neuron. That's not the case here. If we take a discontinuous function of y, of x, which is independent of y and tau, we substitute it in the action and its action is zero. So we see just by staring at the action, the discontinuous configurations are not suppressed by the action. And therefore we should study them more carefully. And in the papers, we analyze them very, very carefully. Now this we are theme in this talk is to go after the global symmetry of the system. This system has a subsystem symmetry. In fact, it has two of them. The momentum one we already discussed before. This is the one that shifts phi by a function of x plus a function of y. This is clearly a global symmetry of this system as it was on the lattice. And it has a net current. So the net current satisfies such a, such a conservation equation. And the key point about it is that it has both partial x and partial y. So we can take the time component j tau integrated along x. And that is already a total derivative. So but only around x, but not around y, a fixed value of y. And it is conserved because its time derivative will be a total derivative, which integrates to zero. So that tells us this conservation equation, the fact that we have two derivatives here, tells us that this is a subsystem symmetry. And indeed there's a net current for the momentum symmetry, the one that shifts phi by a function of x plus a function of y. And this is the conserved current. Unlike the lattice, there is a new symmetry at the level of this action, whose net current is the following. If we hit this by d by d tau and we hit this by dx dy, we see that they cancel each other. So this other current is also a conserved current. Let me make some comments about it. Using condensed matter terminology, we can call it vorticity. Using high energy terminology, we call it winding. Second, this is an emergent symmetry. It is not there on the lattice, but it is there in the continuum. So the continuum theory has it. Now, one might be a little bit nervous about that because I emphasized earlier that we should, when we discuss this action, we should also discuss field configurations which are discontinuous. And if the field configurations are discontinuous, maybe the fact that derivatives commute when you consider that a conservation of this current Maybe this is misleading. So in the papers, we've analyzed it very carefully. We had special rules about which continuities to include, which continuities not to include, how is this compared with the lattice and so forth. I'm not going to do it here, but instead, I, all I want to say is that this was the claim in our paper. And also one might be nervous that the claim could be wrong. We'll soon come back, come back to that. In the in the continuum, this symmetry by itself and this symmetry by itself are anomaly free. However, there is a tooth anomaly, mixed tooth anomaly between these two symmetries. That's easy to compute in the continuum. And that is the statement that we cannot couple the, these two global symmetries to background gauge fields while keeping the system a gauge invariant. The only way to do that 
would be if we can add a higher dimensional bulk theory, which we don't do. So these are some properties of the continuum theory, especially the fact that there is an emergent winding symmetry and a mixed anomaly. A related fact that can be shown over me. Yeah. May I ask a question, Nati? Mm -hmm. So uh, this, if this is a total anomaly, can you uh, express this in terms of one higher dimensional, some maybe invertible topological phases? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. And I'm not sure I have a clear answer to this question, but I think next week in the CMSA seminar that you organize, Fiona is going to give a talk addressing precisely this question. Okay, thank you. May I also ask a question? Yes. Uh, so when you say discontinuities, are, are you talking, um, uh, you know, discontinuities in time as well as space, or are you just thinking about space? In space. In just space. We can make, well, this in Euclidean formulation, it's in space. In, in, if you think of it in a Hamiltonian formulation, there's a Hilbert space and there are states, and we should ask what kind of discontinuities we allow, and then we let the system evolve. The main point is that in, in time, there's only single derivative, right? If we look at this Lagrangian, the the time derivative is standard so there's no time discontinuity but the spatial derivatives are discontinuous i see okay. and if it makes you feel uneasy about these discontinuities you're perfectly justified you should feel uneasy because this is not what we do but as i emphasize this is unavoidable we really have to do it if we want to understand subsystems i see thank you uh, Nati, sorry may i just clarify one more time so these are mixed tohu anomaly uh, Mixed anomaly, to whole anomaly between two U1 uh, subsystem symmetry? Yes. Is that okay? That's correct. And then, okay. And then, yeah, one is the, the momentum, the other is the winding of vorticity. Yeah. I soon give another example of this thing, which everybody here is much more familiar with. I first wanted to discuss this is the system I'm really interested in. And then, as an aside, I will review facts about another system that we all know and love. But this will be in a few slides. In addition, this system has a very interesting self duality. In high energy terminology, it's called T duality symmetry that does not exist on the lattice. Now, Param Quanti et al. did consider some duality transformation on their, app, on their lattice, but it's not a self duality because it maps their Hamiltonian or their system to another system. Here, the system, the system has a self-duality. It maps it to itself. It exchanges the two-dimensional parameters, the u0 and the u, and it exchanges the momentum in winding symmetry. Now, that by itself tells us that this symmetry cannot exist on the lattice, because on the lattice, we have the momentum symmetry, but we don't have the winding symmetry. And therefore, we cannot have any duality that exchanges them. We also analyzed the spectrum of the theory. And we found something quite peculiar. They're clearly plane waves. We can substitute the plane wave solution and solve the plane wave equation, and we find some dispersion correlation. But there are also states that are charged under either the momentum and winding symmetry. But the energy of all these states is infinite. It is of order 1 over A, where A is the lattice spacing. This is very strange. We have a system, and it has some global symmetry, and it has some currents, net currents. The net occurrence coupled to gapless slash massless modes, but all the states charged under the symmetry, under the two symmetries, are have energy of order the UV cutoff. And again, the T duality exchanges these two states, the states charged under the momentum and winding symmetry. So they are infinite in the continuum limit. This fact has a very peculiar consequence. Imagine you have an operator that carries charge under the momentum and winding symmetry, and we act on the ground state. Since, it, since this operator, say this operator carries charge under the momentum symmetry. Since it carries charge, it creates a state that, create, that carries charge. But that state has very, very high energy, energy of order the UV cutoff. That means that if we limit the operators or we put projection operators that the operators act only within the low energy field theory, within the low energy dynamics, these operators are infinitely irrelevant because they create only very heavy states. This means that if we deform our system with operators charged under the momentum and winding symmetry, 
with small enough coefficients, the answer will not change because what these operators do is create states that are at very high energy. So the system is actually robust, what in, high energy, in condensed matter physics is called stable. We can deform the system by operators like e to the i phi or some dipole e to the i phi at one point, e to the minus i phi at the nearby point. And we can deform the system at, either for the momentum or for the winding. And the bottom line is that as long as the coefficient is small enough, nothing changes at long distances. This raises many questions. Some of them have already been asked here. How much of that depends on the continuum limit? After all, my goal here is to understand how to think of such quantum field theories and in the continuum. And the continuum theory has all these bizarre properties. How much of that is really tied to the continuum and how much of that can be realized already on the lattice? And in particular, we discuss subsystem, winding subsystem symmetry, self-duality, et cetera. Equivalently, or alternatively, we should ask how should we treat this continuum field theory more carefully? We discussed these discontinuous fields, discontinuous observables, and meaningful states with divergent energies. Does this really make sense? How should we think about all these questions? So this is my goal. My goal is to answer these questions. In order to address this question, let me digress now and tell you a 40-year-old story. And here, I am almost sure I did not get the references straight. So please help me in filling in the references. I, did, I do hope I got the physics right. And this is, I'd like to draw an analogy between this system and the very well studied XY model in one plus one dimensions. So many people studied it before these authors. This is the classic paper that everybody studied it from. And then there are of course tons of later references. And again, I'm going to study this system in, with Euclidean time with Lagrangian formulation. I basically copied the previous slides here. It's very easy with PowerPoint. You copy the old slide and you just make adjustments. So we have a lattice with phases e to the i phi at the sites. This is something that every one of you have heard a billion times. And I would recommend the best place to read it is a forthcoming book by Subir, which really explains things beautifully. And again, this system is natural because there is a global U1 symmetry. And again, we refer to it as momentum. In the context of string theory, this is the standard momentum that appears in the, in the target space of the string, which is our space time. And this is the global symmetry that shifts phi by a constant. And again, there is a natural continuum limit with an action given by this one, this expression, the new phi square. This action has very similar properties to the one we discussed before, except that this is very anachronistic because this discussion existed about 30 years before the previous one, because it existed already in the 70s. This is a free system and therefore it's straightforward to analyze it. And it has global symmetries, ordinary global symmetries, not subsystem symmetries. There's a net current, which is a conservation equation like this. And the momentum symmetry, which shifts phi by a constant, has this net current. And the winding symmetry or the vorticity has this current. And again, it exists only in the continuum, but not on the lattice. And there's a mixed anomaly between momentum and winding. And this story is really well understood. And I hope it answers Jubin's question, because whatever I said before, is the same as here. The only difference is that here I'm doing one plus one dimension and there I did two plus one dimension. And here it's an ordinary symmetry and there it was a subsystem symmetry. But other than that, this is exactly the same. Now, as we all know, this discussion is correct only for beta large enough. When beta is smaller, the winding operator is relevant and the system is not robust. On the lattice, the winding symmetry is not present. So what we do here is if we write the continuum symmetry, we assume that the winding symmetry is preserved in the continuum. So we write this action. And then we deform this action by turning on operators violating the winding symmetry. And if beta is large enough, these operators are relevant and therefore this is irrelevant. For small enough beta, the operators are relevant and therefore it gaps the system 
and we find the famous BKT transition. In high energy physics, on the other hand, it is common to study this action also for smaller values of beta. And then the winding symmetry is present for all values of beta. We do not deform it by the winding operators. And this is known as the C equals one compact boson with radius R, which is square root of pi beta. And there are tens of thousands of papers discussing this system from all sorts of points of view, which I'm not going to review here, except to mention some salient features. This system has momentum and winding symmetry for all value of beta. There is an exact T duality that maps beta to one over beta or R to one over R. And it exchanges the momentum and winding symmetry. And again, this system, this self duality is not present on the lattice. On the lattice, we don't have the winding symmetry and therefore we cannot have a transformation that exchanges momentum and winding. There is a duality transformation on the lattice, but it maps the circle valued field phi to an integer value field on the lattice. But it's not self duality in the sense that it maps the model to itself. So how much of this continuum discussion that I mentioned here can be present on the lattice? So what we need to do is suppress the vortices. And I asked many people for references. What I'm going to say now I'm 100% convinced was said earlier. And I got some pointers to this paper and this paper. And I strongly believe that there are many other papers before, in between, and after denoted by the ellipses that I left out. And I would appreciate getting more references here. So we use the VLAN formulation of the system. This is, again, very standard. We write the model in terms of not a circle valued field, but a real field phi. But we make it effective, we make phi effectively compact by introducing a Z gauge symmetry, which shift, identified phi with phi plus two pi m. So this is a gauge symmetry which identifies different values of phi and therefore making it compact. And in order to make the kinetic term gauge invariant, we add a gauge field which transforms appropriately. So m is a gauge field residing, sorry, n mu is a gauge field an integer value gauge field residing on the links. And this was invented by Villain, but I understand that even this reference is wrong and it was had been done earlier by others. Now we would like to suppress the vortices. So we suppress the vortices by adding to the action this term. This delta tau nx minus nx delta tau is the field strength of this integer value gauge field. Right, this is like the gauge field, and this is the field strength. So, this is like the field strength square, and the vortices have non zero value of this field strength, and we put it with a coefficient kappa, which penalizes action, with, which penalizes them because they have non trivial action. So, we want to study this system, and in order to suppress the vortices completely, we take kappa to infinity. If kappa is infinite, then the vortices are completely suppressed. There are no vortices, or the field strength of this integer valued field vanishes. And we can replace the action by this action that we will refer to as a modified VLAN action. What did we do here? The first term was copied. And instead of taking this term with kappa going to infinity, we are going to constrain the field strength to be 0. We could put that with the Kronecker delta on every plaquet. But instead, we do it with the Lagrange multiplier field phi tilde residing on the plaquette. And we could think of phi tilde as being a real field integrated from minus infinity to plus infinity. But since it multiplies an integer, it is effectively circle valued. So we have a, Lagrange, a circle valued Lagrange multiplier field phi tilde residing in the plaquette. In the next few slides, I'm just going to study this lattice action. And I emphasize that it is completely well defined. We can work with finite lattice with periodic boundary conditions or whatever boundary conditions you want. We can put it on high genus. We can study this system wherever we want. And everything is just a finite dimensional integral and a finite dimensional sum over these integer fields. So it's completely well defined. In order to avoid confusion with the terminology, I would like to emphasize that both phi and phi tilde, these two scalar fields, phi tilde here and phi here, phi at the sides and phi tildes on the plaquettes are effectively compact. 
Some people might want to refer to this theory as a theory of a non-compact scalar, but this is very confusing for many reasons. For one thing, if phi had been non-compact, I could have absorbed beta into it and get rid of the coefficient beta. But I can't do that because I have this integer here. So this is the theory we'll study. And it turns out that this lattice system, which is completely regularized, everything is completely finite, is very similar to the continuum theory. Let me enumerate the similarity. First of all, it is free. It's quadratic in the fields, just like the continuum theory. Second, already on the lattice, we have both the momentum and the winding symmetry. The momentum symmetry shifts phi by a constant alpha. This is as it was in the continuum. And it is phi tilde by a constant alpha tilde. And they have corresponding net occurrence, which can be worked out from the action. And you can check that they're conserved already on the lattice. These two symmetries have an, a tooth anomaly, a mixed tooth anomaly between them. And notice that the symmetries act on site. So there's this floor that we can have an anomalous symmetries on the lattice only if the symmetry does not act on site. Well, this symmetry does act on site. It shifts phi on site by alpha, and it shifts phi tilde on site by alpha tilde. And yet, there can be a mixed anomaly between them. The reason for that is that the Lagrangian is not invariant under the symmetry, but the action is. So under shifting phi by alpha, this is invariant, and this doesn't transform. If we shift phi tilde by a constant, this term in the Lagrangian is not invariant, but it transforms by a total derivative, and therefore the action is invariant. So this is how anomalies can exist even on the lattice. If you wish, this system is a finite dimensional interval with a finite dimension of sum, and yet it can exhibit a tooth anomalies. We don't need anything, and nothing is infinite. We don't even have continuous time. We can have discrete time and we still have a, an anomaly. In the paper, we study the version of it where space time is just one point. And we still have the anomaly, even when space time is just one point. Okay, then we can take this action as is and perform Poisson ray summation on the lattice. And as we perform the Poisson ray summation, this gauge field is gone. Instead, we get a new integer value gauge field. Phi and phi tilde switch their roles, and beta is inverted. So we get delta mu phi tilde and some integer gauge fields, and the old phi becomes a Lagrange multiplier setting to zero the, field, the integer value field strength of the new gauge field. Now we have two U1 symmetries and a mixed anomaly between them. And therefore, this system must be gapless in order to saturate the toothed anomalies. And therefore, there is no BKT transition. So this was an aside to warm up about the XY model in one plus one dimension. And now we're going to do the same thing in the now we're going to do the same thing in the xy plaquette model, but I can do it a lot faster because it will be essentially the same. Excuse me, Nati, sorry, can I ask? Uh, you mentioned the Tahu anomaly, but you say the symmetries are still on site. So these yeah. are very interesting and mysterious because usually the, the, the familiar case for Tahu anomaly correspondence to the latest symmetry will be non on site. So there's obstruction of gauging. So in your case, how do you understand the obstruction? I of gauge? Think I, first of all, I say that's what people normally say. You can still not gauge it, but not because the symmetry doesn't act on site, but because the Lagrangian is not invariant. The action is invariant, but the Lagrangian is not. But the symmetry acts perfectly on site. I can move it, I can make the Lagrangian invariant, but and the, make the Lagrangian, even the Lagrangian invariant under this symmetry, but then the integer value field will not be single, will not act a would not be invariant under that. Okay, but, but let me just more, mention one more thing. But you mentioned there are mixed whole anomaly, also self anomaly between each of their symmetry as well. Is that right? No, each symmetry on its own, the momentum and winding is anomaly free. It's the okay. combination of them, which is the, the combination of them is, the, the, there's a mixed anomaly between them. Okay, so they cannot be simultaneously gauged. That's but right. You said these two symmetry can still, still be both are realized on site. That's correct. On so the latest. two symmetries act on site. And look, I, 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 I don't have to talk too much. I, I say thanks. This is Thank the you. action and it acts on site. What can I do? Okay, thanks. And they, if some people were, well, I think there's a misconception with the on site, but 
it, it's not a big misconception because the symmetry acts on site, but the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian density is not invariant. What has to be invariant is the action, or more precisely, e to the minus the action. That has to be invariant. But it's not the action on site. That's not the main point. So now I'm going to do the same thing for the XY plaquette model, and I'll do it a lot faster, partly because I'm running out of time. So again, we take this action. This is essentially the action in the Carmichael TNL paper. They did it in the Hamiltonian formalism, but this is the Euclidean action corresponding to it. And we write it in a, in a VLAN form that's again straightforward. We replace every cosine by a square by introducing integer value gauge here. So there's an n tau here in the time direction and n x y here for the spatial directions. And there's a gauge symmetry which makes phi compact. So phi is identified with phi plus two phi m and the gauge fields here and here to form appropriately so that the action is invariant. Notice that the gauge fields n x y and n tau are like a tensor gauge field this, this is only the time direction, it's a regular one, but in space, it has two indices living on the plaquette and it is a symmetric tensor. And now we're going to go through the same set of steps. We are going to suppress the vortices. How do we suppress the vortices? We consider the field strength of the integer value gauge field. So now it's like a recipe. We, we open the book and we just follow the steps. We, this is the integer value field strength of the tensor gauge field that we added, the Vinan field, and we square it and we multiply by kappa. And then we take kappa to infinity. This completely suppresses the vortices and this makes this field strength zero. And then we throw away this term with kappa and we impose a constraint that this integer value field strength, which lives on the cube, vanishes. And we do that by introducing the Lagrange multiplier. So there are lots of indices and there are lots of terms here, but I emphasize that all the steps are straightforward. We started from the original action, we wrote it in the main form, and we add the Lagrange multiplier to set the field strength of the VLAN gauge field to zero. And what we see is that this action is very similar to the continuum version of the XY plaquette model that I started the talk. So at the beginning of the talk, I talked about the XY plaquette model, and then I wrote down kind of a naive continuum Lagrangian for it, continuum action for it, and then I analyzed its properties. I claimed that this lattice model has many of the nice features of the continuum model that I wrote down, except that it's already on the lattice. So I don't have many of the problems that I had before. It's free. It has two subsystem symmetries. The original one was already in, on the, in the original lattice model, like we shift phi by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. But in addition, I have another winding symmetry. I'm using the same terminology as in the xy model. I can shift this field phi tilde by an arbitrary function of x plus an arbitrary function of y. And again, it acts on site. The Lagrangian is non invariant, but the action is invariant. It's very similar to what I did in the ordinary xy model. And so this lattice model, very much like the continuum model I discussed, but unlike the original lattice model with cosines, has both the momentum and the winding symmetry. And if we look at it more carefully, it also has a mixed anomaly between them. And Juven, the symmetry acts on site. It's a subsystem symmetry. It acts on site, it exists on the lattice, and yet there is an anomaly. We can also perform Poisson race summation on these integer gauge fields as we did in the XY model in one plus one dimensions. And we find the, safe, the same self duality I mentioned on the lot or in the continuum discussion, it exchanges phi and phi tilde, it exchanges beta naught and beta, and it exchanges these two symmetries. And again, this is not something that could exist at the level of the original action with the cosines, because at the level of the original action, we had one of these symmetries, this one, but we didn't have that one. And therefore, there cannot be an exact self-duality that maps one to the other. So this is our action, and we can continue to analyze it, and we find other properties that we find in the continuum description. All the states charged under the momentum and winding symmetries have large energy, energy of order one over the lattice spacing. And if you wish, uh, has energy that uh, scales incorrectly with the total length of the system. 
And as I said that, consequently, this entire subsystem symmetry is robust. In fact, the long distance behavior of this action must be gapless because we have an anomaly and the anomaly has to be saturated at long distances. And then we can deform the low energy theory by operator carrying winding, dump, winding charges or momentum charges and check that it is robust under these changes. So this is all I wanted to say about the XY plaquette model. And now to get summarized briefly many other models that we discussed in our paper. But Nati, can I ask? Yes, it's related. So the XY model, the two plus one Ds. So you analyze this two U1 subsystem symmetry. Suppose, can you break this U1 down to some degree Zn? If that's the case, still a layer still. Okay, so yeah, so yeah. in the, you can break it to Zn. And this is something that should be discussed. Again, to leading order when the coefficient of the operator that breaks explicitly the U1 to Zn when the coefficient is small enough, this operator is irrelevant, but it could very well be that, in fact, we're almost certain that if the coefficient is large enough, then the, it, 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 it could drive the system to a different place. We have not analyzed it in detail in this system, but we did analyze it in detail in the ordinary one plus one dimensional X, Y model. Okay, but, but you, you think there's still a, a mixed anomaly, topo anomaly when you break down to Zn? Uh, no, I didn't say that. There might be some if you break the momentum to Zn and the winding to Zm and so forth. We have not analyzed that in a lot of detail. Okay. So, so is the answer yeah. is that some anomaly will stay, but I do, I'm not 100% sure of this. I'm, actually, I think this is correct. I think some anomaly stays. Even okay. if you break it to Zn. So what did we do in the paper? It's just one last thing. But the Zn symmetry still be on site then? Yeah, if, if the U1 is on site, then we're done. And anything okay. that remains on site. No problem. OK, thanks. So what did we do in the paper? Since we had this machine that we can apply to many different systems, we first wanted to calibrate it by applying it to known systems. And we applied it to many systems in quantum mechanics, one plus one dimensions, any number of many dimensions, spin systems or gauge systems, gauge system of higher form, with U1 and ZN systems, we analyze lots and lots of systems. And it always works. It, I'm not saying that every system can be analyzed this way, but a lot of systems can be analyzed. And the modified VLAN version always makes manifest the emergence symmetries of the continuum theory in the retooth anomalies, and also various dualities that are special to the continuum, but are not present in the standard formulation of, the of these systems. So these are a lot of systems that had been analyzed earlier by various people in different number of dimensions and so forth. Much more interesting is to do that for the exotic systems, because after all, this was our goal. And for our here, we had performed similar analysis in the past in the continuum theory. We took the lattice models, we wrote some continuum Lagrangian, we analyzed the continuum Lagrangian and we found all sorts of properties and now we took the original lattice model and we found a new lattice model, checking uh, whether we can reproduce our continuum answers. And we studied gapless models, which are characterized by having a U1 subsystem symmetry. I already mentioned the system in two plus one dimensions, but it has a cousin in three plus one dimension, which we call the phi theory, and it is dual to an exotic gauge theory, the, which we call the A hat theory. We also looked at the tensor gauge theory, A theory, in three plus one dimensions. It is dual to a non-gauge theory, which we call phi hat theory. And we also studied various anisotropic models. So this is for gapless systems that have a U1 subsystem symmetry. We also studied a bunch of gap systems with a Zn subsystem symmetry. And in particular, the Zn versions of all these systems, including the X cube model. Now, in all these systems, the emergence symmetries and the duality of the continuum theories are manifest on the lattice. So originally, the lattice model had some symmetries, which might or might not include various others. In the continuum theory, we found emergent symmetries and some dualities and some anomalies. Now we reproduce all these emergent symmetries and all these dualities and the anomalies already on the lattice. In the other direction, these lattice models can be thought of as 
a rigorous version of the continuum field theories that we had discussed earlier. We discussed continuum field theories with discontinuous field configurations. Now, many of our continuum results can be confirmed in a more rigorous setting on the lattice. So let me summarize because I'm running out of time. We considered previously studied studied both standard and exotic lattice systems. Exotic in the sense that they have a subsystem symmetry. Then we deformed them. This is the recipe or the cookbook recipe. We deformed them slightly by writing them in VLAN form. This is again standard, making them free theories. This part is completely standard. The next step is a more significant deformation that constrains the field strength of the VLAN gauge field to be zero. And we do that with the Lagrange multiplier. The Lagrange multiplier field turns out to be the dynamical field in some dual description of the system. The resulting lattice model, this modified VLAN form of the original model, exhibit new exact global symmetries and the tooth anomalies and new exact dualities. Both of them are not present on the lattice, but had been found earlier in the continuum. And these properties make the modified VLAN theories very close to the continuum theories. The continuum field theory description of these systems has necessarily involves these continuous fields and should make you feel nervous. In fact, I made the point for that in previous talks and also in this talk. This is where this whole UVIR mixing comes in and so forth. Now, the modified VLAN version gives us an rigorous way of justifying all our manipulations in the continuum field theory. Thank you. Stay healthy. And I apologize for going one minute over time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nettie, uh, for the very great talk. Um, yeah, we, we have uh, time for questions. Please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Subir. Can you give an example where this uh, subsystem symmetry is emergent? Uh, yes. That is, the lattice model does not have it, but the continuum does. The original, or the original example that I presented is like that. So the model of Par Paramakanti et al. is an example. The model of Paramakanti et al. has one subsystem symmetry, but the continuum system has two subsystem symmetries. Let me show oh. you. There's a problem with my. I mean, I guess maybe this I. Model, asked this before. model has only this symmetry. Only so one if symmetry. I added a term cosine del x phi to the action on the lattice, that breaks this. Is symmetry. that irrelevant? That's irrelevant, breaks, right? Or no, first of all, this, is, this breaks the symmetry. So what are the rules of the game? First of all, we write this model, and on the lattice, I. We could play two different games. Game number one, we add whatever we want on the lattice. Game number two, we impose this global symmetry and we'll see what we find at long distances. Yeah, we can play well, both I games. want to play game number one. I mean, it's an example of game number one. Yeah, so if you start with this system, you end up at long distances with this system. And then you can ask if you added cosine delta x pi here, what will it translate to here? Here it translates to an operator that violates this, uh, this momentum symmetry. And our analysis showed that this operator in the low energy field theory creates only states that are infinitely heavy. So in that sense, the deformation by this operator is irrelevant. Now, it might very well be that this is true only for infinitesimal values of the coefficients, but if I make the coefficient large enough, it takes me elsewhere. This is almost certainly true because on the lattice, I can add cosine del x phi, and it takes me, it ruins this system symmetry completely. So I'm not making any statement about large deformations of, large deformations of this action. I'm saying that if I assume that somehow I got in the continuum limit to this action, and now I examine the vicinity of this point by examining operators that violate the subsystem symmetry. These operators act, they create states with infinite energy. Okay, thanks. This is very surprising and maybe we made a mistake, but as far as I can tell, this is true. And it's basically the fact that 
if you want to have a, so let's focus on, let, let me explain the intuition behind it because maybe it will help. So if we look at this action, what does this mode do? This is a mode, so imagine in ordinary system, this is a mode that you take all of phi and you rotate them simultaneously. And this mode is like a rotor. And that rotor has very low energy. So you have to quantize it. So say you are in one plus one dimensions, this gives you a rotor. And when you quantize the rotor, it gives you, a, it has its coefficient has the length of the system and it gives you a state whose energy is one over the length of the system. If you do the same analysis here, the relevant mode is a mode that takes all the phi's with fixed value of x, but at all values of y, and you rotate all of them simultaneously. They, this gives us a state whose energy is of order one over L, the size of the system, but the characteristic length scale of the problem is one over L square. This is the energy of the plane waves. So the states that come from quantizing the rotor have energy that is parametrically larger than the energy of the plane waves. And I can do that in a lot more detail. If you wish, if you take this continuum action as is, and you just look at this mode, the kinetic term of that mode must have another factor of the lattice spacing because I'm rotating it only at one value of X with other values of Y. So since there's another factor of the lattice spacing in phi dot square, I have one over A in the Hamiltonian and therefore its energy is of order one over A. It's very surprising. Now, conversely, for the states that are charged under the winding symmetry, they necessarily involve these continuities and they have infinite energy because of this term with the derivative. Now, our t-duality tells us that if we study this system, there's an exact t-duality that exchanges the state's charge under the momentum symmetry and the state charge under the winding symmetry. Now, you could say that this is very suspicious because of all these infinities and the lattice spacing and this and that, but the modified Villain action makes all that manifestly correct because everything is completely finite. So you can take the modified Villain theory, work out the spectrum there and derive the same answer. So I hope this answers your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, Xiaogang? Uh, yeah, this is actually a response to the uh, Sudhir's question. Uh, there's, a, I think, about, in the Villain fraction one third, the quantum Hall state, we have many stacking layers. And then even you include the electron tunnel between layers, then the quasi particle cannot tunnel. So there's an emergent Z3 symmetry. This, uh, there's a mode three conservation uh, for each, each layer have a Z3, mode three conservation. So this is uh, maybe one of the example. Okay, maybe I'll, please send me a reference because I don't know any references. Yeah. So I would appreciate getting a yeah. reference. I'd like to read yeah. about that. You see, I don't know any condensed matter physics, so I feel like I have some tools in my toolkit, but I don't know where to apply them. And one reason I'm happy about this collaboration is that I think this opens the way to combine techniques from different fields to questions, uh, addressing questions from different fields. I think there's a, no, I don't know any explicit reference, but uh, it just say the topology extension cannot tunnel from one layer to another layer. So this is just a, just that's a, that's a general statement. And because the, then the topologic extension is conserved separately layer by layer because they cannot tunnel from one layer to another layer. Only electron can tunnel. So that is a, a general uh, a statement about the topological excitation, yeah. Okay, so I don't know what to say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Let, let's thank uh, thank uh, Nettie again. So uh, we will stop uh, the recording, and the uh, people who want to have further discussions can stay.